Good morning, everyone. I'm Rain Brown. I'm program manager with the uh, Western Region Homeland Security Advisory Council, and I'm glad that you're here with us today for this NPI workshop. Um, a little history on the project. In the summer of 2019, prior to the pandemic, the council began a non-pharmaceutical yeah. interventions project. The goal of the project was to increase um, boards of health, emergency management directors, and other first responders' understanding of NPIs and how and when to use them. Uh, we plan to do this through educational outreach and um, producing a guide to help in the decision-making process in using NPIs. We published the guide in the spring of 2021. And then we embarked on a project to raise awareness of the guide and how to use it. So we have developed uh, an online learning module and is available, which I shared that link with you all when you registered. Um, and then today's workshop is a further key element in educating stakeholders regarding NPIs, um, their role across the spectrum of emergency response and incorporating the NPI guide in your response and efforts. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to the, uh, our region's health coalitions. They did the majority of the work on this project with particular thanks to the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission for putting together the guide and, and developing it in more depth, depth excuse me. Uh, earlier this year, we um, brought on eLearning Lair to help us deliver this portion of the project, including building the online module and then um, in developing and delivering this workshop. And our um, subject matter experts and presenters who are with us today are Drs. Nitin Mohan and Karina B. Dr. Mohan is an assistant professor of the Master for the Master of Management and Applied Sciences and Master of Public Health Programs at Western University Schulich School. Is that how you say that, Schulich School? That's correct, yeah. Great, of medicine. Um, he formerly worked as a physician epi epidemiologist, yes, thank you with that word, at the federal level in the area of infectious disease surveillances and prevent preventative medicine. And Dr. B is a physician and epidemiologist with experience in epidemiological methods, outbreak management, risk assessment, public health policy, as well as clinical research. Dr. B holds a tenured position with the Public Health Agency of Canada and with the Regional Municipality of York as a physician epidemiologist specializing in emergence, emerging diseases, outbreak management, risk assessment frameworks and pandemic pre preparedness. So um, I want to thank both Dr. B and Dr. Mohan for being here with us today. And um, I encourage you to take this opportunity to um, when we get to question and answer portions of this to really uh, pick their brains and delve into this topic so that you can get the most out of this uh, webinar here today. We will, as you can see, we are recording this and we will be posting it um, on um, the Homeland Security Council's website uh, after, uh, after this has finished today. So thank you all for being here and I'll hand it over to Dr. Mohan and Dr. B. Thank you. Thank you, Rain. Um, if we can just start the slide deck, please. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time and giving us the opportunity to talk about this topic. Uh, Dr. B and myself are quite passionate about um, this topic, and we, we think that um, you know it's quite important to share uh, the valuable information here. Um, so again, thank you, folks. Um, just briefly, we'll take a look at the schedule. Um, uh, we'll start off with the introduction into emergencies, uh, followed by um, what are non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, we'll get into some detailed work around hazard identification and risk assessment. Um, talking about hazards and their transmission routes, as well as reviewing a decision matrix for you folks with examples. Um, at this point, we'll have a 10 minute break um, and then we'll close off with um, NPI response and, and what we think is an important 10 step approach, as well as reviewing incident management principles. And um, as we're well aware of our current realities around COVID-19, we'll take away some lessons that, that we're all well versed with. Um, as I'm talking, um, I will be turning my uh, camera off just to preserve any bandwidth and avoid any internet issues. Um, I'll turn it on shortly after for a Q and A portions. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, just you know, uh, hit the emoji with the the hand icon, and and we'll surely um, get to your questions. 
Next slide, please. Our learning objectives for today, um, our hope is that you folks uh, come out of this, this seminar understanding non-pharmaceutical interventions, why they're important, understand the need for advocating for information surrounding NPIs, uh, which I think is quite important. Um, you know, if you take a look back at, at some of the lessons that, that we've learned through the COVID pandemic uh, and some of the, the abilities and the successes and um, shortcomings of communication, uh, the ability to communicate the, the value of NPIs, I think is, is becoming increasingly important. Uh, we'd also like you folks to understand the three primary tools that make up the NPI implementation quick guide and also understand how to identify and react to situations using the guide. So when we think about emergencies, um, I'm sure uh, we have many images and thoughts that come to mind. But for the context of public health emergency, what we're thinking about is a current or impending situation that constitutes a danger of major proportions with the potential to result in serious harm to the health of the public. They're usually caused by forces of nature, a disease or other health risk, an accident or an act, whether intentional or otherwise. They can be declared by government and public health authorities at the federal, state, and regional levels. We'll get into some examples right now. Next slide, please. So here um, we have an image um, of a hurricane and tsunami. Um, and I think we can see the devastation caused by, by this natural disaster. Um, a, an event that comes to mind that I'm sure we're all familiar with is Hurricane Katrina. And I think when reviewing this picture, what we can see is that multiple systems are disrupted um, and we'll have populations displaced. Um, so we can think at, you know, initially that we would have health systems um, will be strained um, as well as health, fire services, EMS and police services uh, would be functioning above capacity, although within limited um, ability based on the geograph geographical um, conditions due to the disaster. Uh, you can also see a situation where school closures um, and disruptions of local supply chains uh, the need for additional supports and measures to help triage and mitigate the damage from an event such as this. Um, and, you know, we're talking about scale here as well. Next slide, please. This image, um, it, it depicts a fire or an explosion. Um, and again, I think what this image is meant to highlight is that in this scenario, we would require um, the expertise of multiple stakeholders. So we're talking about the fire department, EMS, police services, um, acute care and health services as well. And depending on the scale, this may grow. Um, an example of, of a situation where we've had an explosion um, is uh, in, in August of 2020 um, in the country of Beirut, there was a large um, amount of ammonium nitrate stored at a port, uh, uh, sorry, in Lebanon in the city of Beirut um, uh, that exposed, uh, exploded. And it caused about 218 deaths, 7,000 injuries and about $15 billion of property damage. In addition to this, uh, approximately 300,000 people were left homeless. Next slide, please. Um, here we have another natural disaster, um, an image depicting a tornado. Um, and I think this slide highlights one of the unfortunate realities of emergencies. Uh, they can happen quick and often without warning. Um, over a sh short period of time, we can see substantial damage to cities, states, and sometimes countries. Um, again, with the disruption of populations. In a scenario such as this, where the damage would result in infrastructure outage, uh, the ability to even access essential services becomes difficult, and the need for clear communication and efficient systems becomes vital. So I think one thing that, that's sort of um, becoming evident throughout these images is, is that we're in a state of um, uncertainty, um, panic, and in some cases, chaos. Um, and in a normal world where we have access to systems such as police services, fire departments, EMS that work in a certain, a certain functionality, um, they become increasingly difficult to execute in these environments. Next slide, please. And something that's become um, you know, a reality uh, for many of us um, and unavoidable based on the realities of climate changes, um, heat waves. Um, again, this is you know, uh, partially man-made and partially you know, we can classified under a natural disaster, but I think it's more so um, clearly um, attributed to some of the decisions that, that we've made in across our sectors. Uh, but heat waves or heat and hot weather um, can last for several days. Uh, they can have a significant impact on society, including a rise in heat related deaths. Heat waves are among the most dangerous of natural hazards, but rarely receive adequate attention because their death tolls and destruction are not always immediately obvious. Population exposure to heat is increasing due to climate change. 
Uh, globally, extreme temperature events are observed to be increasing in the frequency, duration, and magnitude. Um, as a reference, between 2000 and 2016, uh, the number of people exposed to heat waves increased by um, around 125 million. Um, so we know that heat waves um, are exasperated in cities due to something called the urban heat uh, island effect. Um, the livelihoods and well-being of non-urban communities can also be severely disrupted uh, during and after periods of unusually hot weather. And in these situations, um, heat waves, um, they can burden health and emergency services and also increase the strain on water, energy, and transportation, resulting in power shortages or even blackouts. Um, food and livelihood security may also be strained if people lose their crops or livestock due to extreme heat. Next slide, please. Uh, this image depicts um, a riot and is meant to sort of highlight civil unrest. Um, and we can see that these events can place an enormous amount of stress on police services, EMS, fire response teams, and acute care. And, you know, I think it's, it's important to highlight that there is no health system um, anywhere that can, that can cope with exponential growth, um, be it from, you know, um, an infectious disease like COVID or um, an event that, that causes mass casualties or disruption to our system, such as civil unrest. Um, any sustained periods of exponential growth pose, pose considerable risk across sectors. Uh, with downstream effects that will permeate within the system for some time. Um, and again, I think it's important to, to sort of highlight how our systems are interconnected here um, and the need to sort of um, identify efficient matters for us to, to communicate in these moments. Next slide, please. This image um, depicts chemical, biological, uh, radiological, nuclear, and explosive events, um, otherwise known as CBRNE. Um, and they refer to the uncontrolled release of chemicals, biological agents, or radioactive contamination into the environment or explosions that cause widespread damage. These events can be caused by accidents uh, or by terrorist attacks. Um, and if you recall the, the slide where we, could, uh, where we had um, uh, a fire and explosion, and we talked about the chemical event, uh, we can see how certain events are, are, are linked to one another. Next slide, please. Here we have an image that is meant to depict infrastructure collapse. Um, an example that comes to mind is the Delhi building collapse in South Florida. Um, and it's a serving reminder that fragile infrastructure can have tragic public health consequences. Um, but it's important to also highlight that, you know, um, across our country, uh, we do have strong infrastructure, but there are areas um, uh, where earthquakes, wildfires, tornadoes are a recurrent risk. Um, it's estimated that some 143 million Americans live in potentially seismically active regions, uh, while another 43 million American homes are in wildfire prone areas. So it's precisely in areas like these where typical and good construction standards are insufficient to withstand threats from strong earthquakes, severe winds, or raging wildfires. Such hazards test the resiliency of America's built environment. A key component of our total infrastructure also includes thousands of dams, levees, water, and water treatment systems, power plants, and the complex natural grid systems. And when we factor in um, our knowledge of climate change and, and the increased likelihood um, of extreme weather events, Again, you can see situations where our built environment um, uh, is at risk and, and thus, you know, destabilizing populations um, and putting a strain on many of our services. Next slide, please. Just a quick recap of the types of emergencies. Um, we've tried our best to detail them with images, but there's some that, that we think um, we want to highlight as well. So again, we can have emergencies within the agriculture and food systems. Um, environmental, extraterrestrial, hazardous materials, health, public safety, structural, supply and distribution, and transportation. And you can see a situation where if we have an, uh, an emergency in one of these um, areas, for example, envir environmental, um, you know, it will cascade and, and you'll also see disruptions within the transportation, supply chain, structural, public health safety. Um, so we really are interconnected here when we talk about emergencies. Next slide, please. So this takes us to um, sort of the core of our, our seminar today uh, with regards to non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, so, you know, I think it's appropriate at this moment to, to just use an example that I think we're all very familiar with, um, which is the pandemic that, that we're living in right now. Um, so there are different approaches to limiting the spread of illness. Um, one approach is, is pharmaceutical and drug interventions. 
Uh, so things like vaccines or antiviral medications, and these would prevent disease or its complications. However, in a situation um, like we've all experienced right now, we may not have availability to these pharmaceutical interventions right away. Um, you know, we, we may not have the information to act on this right away. And in these situations, um, you can see uh, how valuable non-pharmaceutical interventions can be. Um, so MPIs include both actions that individuals um, and households can take. An example would be frequent hand washing, covering coughs and sneezes, or keeping a distance from sick people. In addition, social distancing policies that communities can enact. So an example would be closing schools, working from home, uh, restricting public gatherings. Um, these are specifically geared to limiting the spread of a disease that is transmitted from person to person. NPIs are the most important tool that mayors and political leadership teams will have to reduce deaths. Not only will they, will they be available and accessible at the local level, but they're likely to be very effective in limiting the spread of disease and reducing the number of deaths, um, preserving our healthcare systems, um, ensuring services like fire, police, and EMS are able to function um, uh, to their, their um, optimal efficiency. Next slide, please. So what we'd like you folks to take away from this is that um, NPIs or non-pharmaceutical interventions are non-medical farm reduction strategies. Uh, they mitigate the hazards and risks associated with different types of threats. Um, some easy examples are, are isolation and quarantine um, and social distancing and the use of PPE. Um, you know, again, things like hygiene, external decontamination um, and restrictions on movement or travel are things that we can do in an environment that's fast moving dynamic where we don't have pharmaceutical interventions uh, immediately or we don't have the ability to procure pharmaceutical interventions at the scale that we need them. At this moment, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. B. And thanks, Nitin. Okay, so the first process that we wanted to include in this lecture series is called the FIRA um, or the, sorry, um, yes. The, so this is a framework that may look um, very familiar to those of you who've worked outside of healthcare uh, because the concepts are actually quite simple and applicable to other industries. Um, and so the Thyra is the Threats, Hazards, Identification, and Risk Assessment Framework. So this is one of the, uh, the most important starting points for assessing any risk of an emergency, regardless of whether or not it's health related. Specifically, we could apply a thyroid to evaluate the risks of mass gatherings, for example. Um, and they're especially important for really large international events, such as the Boston Marathon, the Super Bowl, or the Olympics. We use it in public health when we start noticing an increasing trend in disease, um, say for the flu, for the seasonal flu, um, to inform travel advisories of travel-related diseases, such as uh, yellow fever or dengue or even for gastrointestinal outbreaks um, in particularly densely populated areas, such as cruise ships or army bases. So effectively, when we use the FIRA and include the FIRA in an evaluated report for, say, stakeholder engagement, it demonstrates that we've considered all possible risks and the impacts for a specific situation. It's also a fairly flexible tool. Um, so you can use a FIRA when you're not sure if there's a risk, um, you can use it when you feel like the risk might be emerging, or you can use it to establish that there definitely is a risk, and we can leverage that information to initiate an emergency response plan. Some health units are using this as an annual or biannual ranking of the overall risks of emergencies in the state of Massachusetts. We can compare um, a pandemic head-to-head -head with the risks of a cyber attack to natural disasters um, in events such as terrorism. So similarly, um, when we approach this framework, we have a few steps. Um, and the first and most important step is to provide the scoping. <clears throat> so in order to uh, start, we define the scope, context, and approach for any specific situation. We want to restrict the location, the event type, and the population we're dealing with. And if your team is part of a specialist area, we, want, we might um, consider restricting the risk, as risk assessment to only in public health, or a specific department of emergency services. So before we start, uh, let's bring in a specific example to guide some of our learning. Um, I'd like everyone here to imagine that the state of Massachusetts is gearing up. Um, it's gearing up for a mass event. It's the 250th Independence Day celebration that will take place on July 4th of 2026. So to define the scope of this, we would like to inf include information about the number of 
organized events, the type of events, the population density and distribution, any vulnerabilities that we might see in the cities and towns, and the capacity and resourcing of, of emergency services. So once we get a better understanding of the scope, uh, then we can spend some time hypothesizing a range of worst case events, which can be a hazard or threat for our mass gathering event. So before I begin further, what is truly the difference between a hazard and a threat? So the Department of Homeland Security defines a threat as a natural or man-made occurrence, individual or entity or action that has the potential to harm life information, operations, the environment or property. So a threat is usually an external source that is a risk to an organization. Um, and many security professionals consider threats to be man-made and with malicious intent. On the other hand, a hazard is any dangerous condition or potential source of danger that can lead to a risk consequence. So we can think of it as all hazards are not threats, but that all threats are hazards. And the most common hazards we can consider are naturally occurring events. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm going to turn a little bit over to our audience. Um, everyone feel free to turn on your muted mics or join the chat. Um, I'm asking you to come up with some risk scenarios that might result from an Independence Day celebration. So in the worst case, what could potentially happen? Awesome, Pat, I see that you're unmuted. Would you like to speak up? I'm sorry to pick on anyone. Yes, absolutely, Luke, um, I see you in the chat. Um, definitely, we can have some man-made, um, yes, excellent, uh, man-made events, such as a terrorist attack or um, a human-created uh, disaster. We can definitely have a major heat event um, as the event is taking place in the summer. Any other ideas? So we're bringing a lot of people together from worldwide. Um, we can also introduce um, infectious diseases. Yes, absolutely. We can get chemical spills. Um, we can have electrical outages, so the infrastructure around us would be stressed um, from the demand. Yes, definitely um, weather events as well. So maybe not a blizzard, um, but uh, an electrical storm could cause power failures. Great, thanks everyone for your ideas this morning. Um, other things we might consider are um, more mundane, but can also create a lot of hazards. So things like civil unrest, we might see increased crime coming into the cities, um, we might have looting, theft, and requirement for armed defenses, um, we might have um, in additional emergency room visits from injuries, alcohol and drug related problems, food and waterborne illnesses, um, and again definitely heat related illnesses too. <clears throat> Great, so I think most of you have touched up on the major ones. Um, so let's move on to one of the first slides. Slide 16, please, next. Thank you. Um, so for each of the possible hazards and threats that we just mentioned, um, we're first going to consider the probability of these events actually occurring. So if you have access to local or statewide data, this might help you compare and contrast against real world evidence. So for some things like foodborne or heat-related heat illnesses, uh, we might consider these to fall under the frequent category. Uh, for other things such as crime or civil unrest, we might consider these to be probable. And for the outages that you've mentioned, um, crowding, stampeding, a structural collapse, these would be very unlikely, but definitely scenarios that we want to keep in mind. And for additional threats, such as a coordinated cyber attack or terrorist activities, we might consider these to be very rare, but again, it would be important to dedicate some planning in these possibilities. Next slide, please. So after ranking our hazards and threats by likelihood, we're going to repeat this task based on their impact. So if we have a few people becoming ill from say a mild respiratory illness, that impact might be very low, 
Um, but if we have the majority of people becoming sick from a very severe illness, then the impact would be more major and we would consider this a significant burden for frontline healthcare providers. So similarly, where a structural collapse might be very unlikely, um, such an event could happen and could have a huge impact for everyone, um, leading to an overwhelming ripple effect, including impacts of injuries and deaths, um, increased use of emergency services, panic, impact to traffic and access, um, and more. So some hazards and threats may have a range of possibilities. So the definitions here are just a general guide for your analysis, um, but you can feel free to reclassify based on your own data. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna put it all together. Now that we've ranked every hazard and threat by probability and by impact, we'll plot them together on this matrix. And again, um, <clears throat> these colors, um, you can feel free to assign each box box based on your personal judgments as well. Generally, this matrix is aiming to help us classify and communicate risk also to other departments. For example, if we see a really hot weather event leading up to the event, we can identify heat-related illnesses as a main hazard, and we can um, assume that it has a major impact to many people, and due to this, we can communi communicate through media channels that the risk is high and additional measures such as cooling stations or weather advisories might be, in, might be called into effect immediately. On the other hand, with the risk of a terrorist attack um, or a cyber attack, which is much more rare, um, if we do have intelligence reports at the time of the event to raise that threat to probable, we might lead to a higher impact classification for the public and the communication may be the impetus call for additional police presence or for, say, financial institutions to take additional measures. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, risk categories are important because we use them to communicate risk across departments, professions, levels of government in somewhat of a comparable way. Um, it also allows us to set up thresholds for stepwise action. So when the risk increases, we know what to do. Um, we can call for help, we can notify the public, we can divert resources or even cancel events. Next slide, please. So at this point, I'll turn it back to the audience just to recap quickly on the number of hazards that we've seen so far. So feel free to think back on some of the photo slides that Nitin presented or some of the situations that you might've seen in the news or that you've experienced personally. Again, um, feel free to write in the chat or speak up personally. So again, we've seen biological, chemical or radiological um, emergencies. We've also seen things like riots or stampedes. <clears throat> we have a quiet group this morning um, and definitely um, man-made issues like explosions, cyber attacks, um, and potential natural issues, um, natural disasters and infrastructure collapse. Okay. So this, this is Sandra. I just like Sandra Martin. I just like to remind everybody that the threats, um, well, I think everything is related to public health. The threat may look like it's a threat to the infrastructure for, um, or, or to the responders or to some other threat. It's not necessarily a threat to the medical system or the public health system. So I think we have to think very broadly about how hazards and threats impact a whole community and not just the public health the traditionally thought of public health or healthcare system. Thanks so much, Sandra. Yes, absolutely. Um, we're trying to take the lens of all emergencies that we can assess from any situation. Um, and hopefully you can apply this in your working or uh, personal life as well. We're not um, necessarily honing in from a public health angle, knowing that um, many of you professionals on the line may not be working in public health. Um, however, we, we will include some examples towards the end. Thanks, Sandra. Okay, so 
<clears throat> Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about hazards and how they might propagate risk. For some hazards, like biological hazards that you see in the first column there, um, they can be transmitted through all kinds of routes. Some through airborne droplets, um, sorry, airborne or droplets, um, and sometimes off surfaces, which we call fomites. And others can affect people through the fecal oral route um, from contaminated food, water, um, or through animals where a disease can transition from an, from an animal or an insect into humans. On the other hand, we have other hazards. Um, we can reference the last column, column eight, where we have cybersecurity threats. And these have very restrictive transmission routes. So mainly through electricity and the internet um, network connectivity. We spend a little bit of time here talking about natural disasters. Um, so things like flooding can cause ob obvious damage to roads and buildings, but it can also lead to high cases of foodborne and vector-borne illnesses over the short term. Um, and some long-term effects can then affect uh, waterborne illnesses such as sewage contamination of livestock and crops that can last for months or even years. Hurricanes um, can, can cause injury and obviously damage buildings and infrastructure, but some of the long-term consequences for that would be electrical outages or radiological or chemical spills that could last for long periods of time. And things like ice storms can cause immediate power outages, um, but also lead to unsafe indoor food preparation, for example. It can cause high levels of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and in addition to that, put a lot of stress on our services. So landlocking emergency services, um, making it in, impossible to um, respond to things like fires or crime prevention. So in this way, it's important for us to understand how one hazard may interplay and contribute to the propagation of other downstream risks as well. Uh, based on what we've discussed, you can refer to this table when considering different types of hazards and threats and consider what kind of downstream they may have uh, for your specific communities. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've covered some of the basics on identifying and assessing for risks. Let's talk about the main topic of our um, discussion today. What are some interventions that we can use to combat threats? Um, in this lecture, moving forward, we'll cover 16 non-pharmaceutical interventions. As we go through these interventions, it's important for you all to consider the impact of these interventions on society, the sheer amount of resources, costs, and logistics required. Um, and it's also important to consider that for different communities, there's different tolerances for what is really considered acceptable. For it, so it's for our judgment to determine um, what might be the best fit. Next slide, please. So this may look familiar to some of you, um, and I'll start from the beginning and um, briefly summarize each and every one of these NPIs. So in terms of the first one, public education and guidance, in my opinion, this is one of the most underrated and empowering types of interventions where we can enhance government transparency with the public and also help share information quite quickly. However, um, guidance can be difficult when evidence changes quickly or when we have disjointed information across some expert groups. So incorrect and delayed information can really degrade trust with the public. And once things move in that direction, it's really difficult to rebuild that. Then it's a really, um, then it's really an uphill battle um, to overcome things like computer conspiracy theories or conflicting information. B, good hygiene and health practices. <clears throat> For some examples that are um, things like being courteous, covering your sneezes and coughs, asking people to stay at home when they're sick. Um, these are communal practices that can be learned and normalized to promote better hygiene etiquette. Personal protective behavior um, are other behaviors such as cleaning, hand washing, um, limiting capacity in particularly private spaces, keeping windows open. These interventions along with um, B, good hygiene, <clears throat> are, are ones that are, tend to be well accepted, but a little bit inconvenient. And this requires a bit of a culture shift or attentiveness 
on behalf of groups to really adopt these strategies. For personal protective equipment, um, we have things like masks, gloves, goggles, hazmat suits, hard hats. And similar to before, this intervention requires a bit of a cultural shift as it can be seen as inconvenient. However, compared to personal protective behavior, um, this would be much more of a costly intervention. So when we implement something like this, we need to consider, a, consider the cost of acquiring supplies, maintaining those supply lines, ensuring um, these items are up to code and they're not expired, and coordinating the logistics of making these supplies available for those who really need them. For social distancing and cohorting, now similar to personal protective behavior, social distancing is a low economic cost intervention. However, as we've seen with COVID, prolonged use of this intervention can have huge economic costs for retail and restaurants, and also an elevated social cost, particularly for our young and our elderly populations. So as with other behavioral changes, this requires a strong trust and collaboration from the public to ensure that these measures do actually have an effect in risk reduction. So for surveillance and rapid testing, this is one important one for containing the further spread of a disease or a worsening condition. <clears throat> and these situations can be for things like poisoning, radiological spills, all the way to communicable disease and animal bites. So early access to reliable testing and diagnosis in cases of travel-related disease, such as Zika, are important for us to reduce spread beyond just the initial state or place of infection to some other downstream consequences, such as to unborn infants in the case of Zika. While the overall cost might be low, um, such testing, sorry, the overall societal cost, um, that is, testing costs may be really difficult to sustain if large portions of our populations are affected in the long term. Now with sanitation, ad adequate waste management and cleaning are required um, at the public level and can also be taken on by private entities. Um, not only are we really considering the act of cleaning here, but also the disposal and cost of um, associated with such. So sustaining these resources and costs are not easy and can really mean the difference between keeping a school or a business open at the grassroots level or closing it down completely. Finally, H Environmental health, um, different agencies currently work together on a routine basis to ensure that things like food, water, air, and housing um, are safe for the public. And when these processes are compromised, fixing or improving them can come at a great cost and have huge implications for the entire population. So we have seen um, an ongoing public health emergency in Flint, Michigan with safe potable water, which has led to some cases of heavy metal poisoning. We can also turn to our food industry and the importance of monitoring meat, dairy, and fruits and vegetables to reduce foodborne illnesses. And while other intervention strategies um, tend to be more reactive, the high societal cost of environmental hazards has taught us over the years to really set up those routine policies and procedures um, under government agencies such as the FDA to uphold higher standards to keep us safe. Hi, Sandra, I see your hand up, go ahead. Um, I think we were doing this chart every, you know, you learn more as you go on. Number E, social distancing. I think I would um, say that economic costs and social costs have been high, not, um, you know, basically we found out that social distancing has a huge impact on a lot of parts of our society, like um, economics, uh, restaurants, businesses, and social costs are pretty high too in the school system and stuff. So this one, if I were doing it today, I would say that social distancing is a lot more expensive than we thought. Thanks, Sandra. I absolutely agree with you. I think the extent to which we have used social distancing as a strategy has shown us that prolonged periods of time make it very unsustainable for the general public. Thanks for that. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please, Andy. Great, so now we're moving into strategies with a higher cost and resource requirement. 
Um, so in terms of engineering controls, um, economic costs are very high because there is a need to bring experienced technicians, innovative equipment, and to really establish a detailed and effective plan. Um, often for emergencies, the priorities can quickly change unexpectedly and add to upfront resources and operation costs. Um, also, <clears throat> as the duration of the emergency continues, some of these controls may be, become part of the new business standard and be expected. Um, so this may require transition over to more sustainable solutions, making the economic costs of this type of intervention particularly high. And building on that, um, hardening infrastructure is a scaled up version of engineering controls. With regards to costs and resources, we're talking really about a sustainable change to prevent and mitigate the impacts of a particular emergency, but also future emergencies. So following an example like Hurricane Katrina in 2005, I think they invested about 14 billion in providing a better infrastructure system in addressing um, risks of future flooding. So the implemented measures such as um, improved data systems for routine surveillance of rain and weather, forecasting technologies for hydraulic modeling, um, construction design to mitigate land subsistence and to counteract rising sea levels in some areas. Um, so such projects require such a great deal of upfront investment and a really strong vision. From my personal experience working in emergency diseases, um, or emerging diseases, sorry. Um, investing heavily in this hypothetical is always a very tough sell. And it's more so than investing in a less but immediate reality for some. So moving on to case and contact tracing. <clears throat> this remains on the list as a moderate cost um, and primarily exists as an MPI for infectious diseases. So we can think of this as a very laborious task for frontline workers and to consider their point of view. Um, they've been redeployed to these positions with very little notice. They have to learn new technology and new processes, and they have to detail important epidemiological concepts at times, which they may not have training for. So when we implement this intervention, I think one of the most important things to consider would be training, shadowing, refresher courses. These are absolutely essential. Otherwise, in the grand scheme, what we tend to get is garbage data in, garbage results out. For <clears throat> isolation and quarantine enforcement, um, in the recent months, we've seen routine usage of the quarantine order with more respect to <clears throat> travel return and infected individuals. However, um, when I did a um, scan and read a report, it seems to show that martial law in the US has been declared at least 68 times. Um, and primarily for the use to control riots and civil unrests in situations like labor disputes and um, domestic violence. Mainly these have taken place over the um, early 1900s. However, uh, we've seen definitely, thankfully, um, a much lower tolerance for these interventions now. So it's better understood that preventing movement does have major and personal um, economic costs and even crosses the line of acceptability to infringe on personal liberties. So I think this strategy is best reserved for some of the most grave emergencies. Work policy changes. So sometimes hazards can stretch for unexpectedly long periods of time, um, such as in the case of droughts, ice storms, epidemics, or even chemical spills. These situations put a lot of pressure on everyday institutions and businesses to really maintain that status quo, um, either because the workplace has become unsafe or even simply that it may appear to be unsafe for some. So de depending on the type of work environment, eventually policies should come into place to ensure a more accountable workplace. So we have policies which include paid sick days, remote or flexible work, hazard pay, um, things like PTSD counseling, safety training, and so on and so forth. Procedures and embargoes. Um, when a location becomes unsafe in any event, some bodies of the government, um, such as the FDA or the Medical Officer of Health or the Sheriff's Department, they do retain the right to shut these um, locations down. So on a more routine basis, um, we see restaurants and salons that may fail to meet safety requirements 
They're frequently inspected, and if they fail, they are subject to either being temporarily or permanently closed down. Other buildings and structures, um, such as stadiums or bridges and roads, um, that may lead to mass injury accidents or um, in some building cases, asbestos poisoning, these can be seized and they can also lead to a very high resource and economic costs to those left holding the bill and those who are responsible. For travel restrictions, um, while travel restrictions and warnings do pose um, an international relations challenge, they're a really important way for noticing, notifying travelers of situations that are happening overseas. So travel advisories can be issued for emergencies in other countries, such as riots and civil unrest, as well as for things like communicable disease. So actual restrictions tend to be a little bit more difficult in the US from the regulation perspective. However, we see that smaller island nations often use travel restrictions heavily to avoid the importation of pests and disease from sweeping through their highly susceptible communities. And finally, decontamination. Um, we see the resource and cost profile here is similar to that of sanitation and environmental health, with just the technical expertise, the equipment, the infrastructure needed for decontamination efforts really results in the strategy being one of the highest costs overall. So I think I might wrap this up with um, one example from the Exxon Valdez oil spill on the coast of Alaska. Um, after the spill, we implemented measures such as booms being used to absorb and contain the oil. We use burning by fire and um, biochemical surfactants that were used to break down the oil partially. But overall, the decontamination costs were estimated close to $4 billion um, with further immeasurable environmental and social consequences. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, everyone. So I'm recognizing that that was quite a bit of information. At this point, we're going to take a break um, just for a few minutes. So let's say um, we'll reconvene at 11.05. Um, please feel free to mute your mics or sign out, take some time to relax, take a bio break, and we'll see you back in about 15 minutes. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone, thanks for joining back. I'm sure that people will continue to trickle in, um, but I'll get started now. So for the next 30 minutes, um, we'll continue to discuss and build on some of the concepts that were introduced this morning. Um, and for now, maybe I'll give a small recap of the things that we have um, included. So this morning, we talked a little bit about the different types of emergencies that we can see um, and the different stakeholders involved. Um, Nitin also introduced the idea of non-pharmaceutical intervention strategies. Uh, we've discussed the FIRA, um, the Threats, Hazards, Identification, and Risk Assessment Framework. Um, and when we did so, we identified some hazards and threats. We ranked them by both probability and then by impact um, for risk categorization and communication. And after that, we chatted a bit about the different hazards and their transmission routes, um, as well as their downstream considerations for impact. And just before the break, um, we reviewed all 16 types of non-pharmaceutical interventions as potential mitigation and prevention strategies in the case of any emergency. So I think now we're ready to go ahead and apply some of these tools to a more specific scenario. Um, and we're going to use the 10 step method that some of us are familiar with. So um, before moving on to the next slide, I think we will build on our 250th Independence Day example. And let's imagine that we're fast forwarding into 2026 itself. And let's say that we're all uh, prepared and coordinated and all that work has already taken place. So imagine today is June 27th and we have one week before the actual celebration event. We're expecting about 10 million people in the state for the weekend and they'll be attending a variety of public and private events. So for the past two weeks, um, we have started to notice that the Temperature is unusually warm and humid, and that the humid X um, with the temperature has fluctuated to about 85 to 104 degrees in the greater Boston area. So now we're all strongly suspecting that we'll have a heat wave in the 250th weekend, and our department has gathered a tiger team to reassess the situation. <clears throat> so next slide, please.
And next slide, please. So the very first step in our 10 step response is to really assess the hazard. So if our team has conducted a comprehensive thyra of a heat wave months ago, we could refer to that information, but if not, this would require a bit more work. Along with identifying that this is a natural disaster, we can, rent a, we can reference quantifiable evidence from previous situations in the past, either in Boston or elsewhere. Um, and this is very much of an environmental scan. We could identify the susceptible populations at this point, consider marginalized groups, such as the young, the elderly, individuals with no fixed address, um, and determine the incidence of illness, which might take effect if the temperature were to stay as it is, or worse, if it continues to rise. <clears throat> so let's consider some obvious non-pharmaceutical interventions to mitigate illness. We could start off by notifying the public of the warm and extreme weather advisories days before the event. And we can start educating the public on the signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Another strategy would be to consider delaying events um, taking place, especially during the warmest hours, and start moving them into the, <coughs> into the evenings um, to the cooler temperatures. We can also set up water dispensing stations, which allow free accessible hydration and consider setting up public cooling stations as well. Uh, we could also account for additional med emergency medical services that might be needed. So we could allocate overtime capacity for these personnel and resources. And finally, for the very large crowded events, we can consider shortening or canceling them as well. So how much will some of these options cost? Will they need external resources and time for coordination? For some of these basic ideas in place, um, we can now repeat the detailed FARA um, now for a higher probability and perhaps a moderate impact at this point and consider what the risk categories which should be communicated to other stakeholders. So step two, notifying local public, notifying response partners. <clears throat> so the local public health unit tends to have very strong partnerships with local hospitals, emergency services, such as fire, police, paramedics, as well as with the Board of Health. So it's important for everyone to be aware of the key stakeholders at play in the event that emergency might be declared. Um, and those people will need a direct line of information for additional support. So in this step, it helps to determine who is really responsible for certain tasks um, in the event that we are call for help. Also to ensure um, we should have the contact details such as direct phone numbers and emails collected and make sure that they're up to date in case they're needed. So step three, let's review the plans, policies, and procedures. <clears throat> so what is the plan? How do we know when we should be coming, we should be increasingly worried? Um, do we know if the go-ahead plan depends on the temperature outside or the number of people with illnesses coming into our emergency departments? Decisions will be made, um, will be, need to be made um, in advance to establish these thresholds and the thresholds for action. Um, as they're part of the emergency response plan. It's also important to consult with a legal team on things like authority, such as the right to issue an emergency media advisory, um, to cancel an event, or to really take over a private space, such as a stadium, um, in order to support emergency care, or um, so on and so forth. So it's better to have that counsel before the emergency is declared. Step four. <clears throat> so if an emergency is declared, who does what? When an emergency is declared, we typically shift into a different organizational structure as a whole, um, which is smaller and more nimble. Um, this is known as the Incidents Command System, or the ICS. So in your new structure, your organization could be restructured under new functional units, and we call these things like planning, operations, finance, or logistics. And for each unit, we will need to identify leads that we typically call chiefs um, and key personnel reporting to each chief. So to provide you with an example, using the COVID response, uh, many epidemiologists were redeployed from their regular positions into the planning team within local public health. And this is mainly due to our analytic abilities with data. Nurses and inspectors were redeployed into operations as case investigators due to their medical expertise, their communication skills, and um, record keeping abilities. 
And then we have projects assistants, um, executive assistants, librarians, we're deployed into liaison teams um, because they're very good at tracking the most recent CDC guidance, the point of health messaging. Um, as, as such, they're able to disseminate these changes to the rest of the team internally, but also make that information accessible to the media and to the public. So as you can see, step four is fairly important um, because we're able to identify the skills and experiences and roles available, um, which should be mobilized during the emergency. And step five, <clears throat> begin public information. So over the years with COVID, we have seen how uncoordinated information can be very confusing and overwhelming, and sometimes just completely wrong. Even with the best of intentions, poor communication breaks down that trust between teams and across organizations. So this step five really highlights the importance of ensuring that the information is clear for everyone, that it's consistent, and that we can hear the message as soon as it's released. Sharing information readily, um, such as in the form of website dashboards or media broadcasts, can help the public understand what's happening. Um, it helps them believe the decisions that are being made are based on real life evidence and helps us unite together, especially when the situation or that the decisions made to mitigate the emergency are getting very tough. So in the case of this scenario that we're proposing, letting the public know early of that health of that heat wave and the possibility of needing to cancel events gives people the time to make alternate plans for their loved ones and to stockpile or provide the resources necessary. Next slide, please. So step six, identifying resources. Resourcing during an emergency situation would normally fall under the logistics team of the incident command system. So if we need anything, um, such as additional emergency personnel to be on standby, additional police presence, a stockpile of, say, medical equipment, a PPE, um, to other things like the delivery of safe drinking water or electricity, or the acquisition of particular items like cooling stations, all these elements we can consider in advance and really ensure that they are available um, at a moment's notice when an emergency is declared. For step seven, um, now we consider health equity. As per usual, we should always remember that emergencies affect marginalized populations the hardest. At this step, um, we should take some time in considering who those people might be and if they need additional help. So for a heat wave, uh, naturally we would think of seniors, particularly those that are living alone. We should think about infants and young children who are at a higher risk of dehydration. Uh, we can also consider individuals with respiratory conditions or cardiovascular disease. And then individuals in group homes, shelters, or with no fixed address, um, we should touch base with them and <clears throat> ensure that uh, the proper resourcing is available if needed. And then to apply a slightly different lens on it too, um, we can think about the general public who might not have internet access or who might not even speak English or Spanish as their primary language it would be really important to try and target these populations with the messaging that we have available. So um, I guess with that, I'll share a personal example um, from the greater Toronto area. So at the beginning of COVID, um, the Peel region, um, due to its multi-generational housing and high cultural diversity, was one of the worst hit and worst identified hotspots for the disease. Um, but when the public health unit started really looking into health equity and started community campaigns in different languages, um, really targeting local heroes and leaders and um, entering schools and community centers and places of worship with um, more information, vaccination rates were able to rise from about 80% up to 97% in these areas. And that uh, public health unit has now become one of the highest vaccinated and covered areas, um, really reducing the impact of overall disease. So we can see here from this example that health equity um, <clears throat> is very important and provides us the extra um, oomph, as you might say, to some of our existing strategies. Step eight. <clears throat> so finally, we've arrived at the interventions. After identifying all our options and systematically reviewing for the resources, costs, um, and the impact on society, eventually we'll need to implement our NPI strategies. So again, I'm going to take this moment to turn it back over to you all um, to suggest a few interventions that you yourself feel like are more acceptable and um, that are feasible. 
And in doing so, if you could just identify that stakeholder group who might be responsible for actually executing the task. So I might give you an example here. Um, so for the liaison team of the ICS and the media, these folks would be important in executing things like weather advisories. <clears throat> so for additional support and things like that, um, if, if you could comment in the chat, that would be really helpful. Okay, I see we have a fairly quiet group today. Um, I suppose I'll go on. Yes, Sandra, <laughs> education, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> education from the public health unit, education and coordinating information uh, from a joint information um, system. We have um, additional support for EMS services. So we'd be liaising directly with fire, police, paramedics. Um, medical officers, they would be announcing event restrictions and cancellations of events. We could also be uh, speaking to hospital CEOs to monitor um, what they're seeing on the front lines. So are they getting more ER visits for heat related illnesses? Do they have data for this? Absolutely. I think it's also really important, Sandra, uh, definitely to, not, to be transparent with the public. Um, sometimes when we try to paint a beautiful picture that things are all green and um, all the strategies are working, it really erodes trust. Um, the public are always smarter than we give them credit for. So it's really important to demonstrate that um, in some cases, the evidence is showing that it may not be working. Great. Okay, so moving on to step nine. Um, step nine is really about determining the efficacy of our strategies. <clears throat> so in some situations, as for our heat wave emergency, it might be necessary to deploy a variety of interventions at the very same time. Uh, for more prolonged emergencies, such as a communicable disease or a chemical spill, we might choose to deploy the most impactful interventions one at a time um, to determine if these strategies are actually working with the evolving emergency. So as these strategies become implemented, it's important to also collect data and objectively determine whether or not there's improvement. Um, some of the questions that we might ask ourselves is whether the public is even aware of the health of the heat wave. So are there public communications working? Um, can we, we can actually monitor things like web clicks or telephone calls to local health units um, discussing these issues. Another question might be, are people using potable water stations that we're providing? If so, how many gallons are we using every day? Are we running out in certain locations? <clears throat> also, are the EMS services on site really allowing us to treat urgent medical issues? So how, how many heat related conditions are really being identified daily? How many avoidances of the emergency room are we permitting? Um, and also, what do the emergency departments and hospitals look like? What is the bed capacity at these hospitals? These are all quantifiable pieces um, and measures that we can use to um, identify if improvement is happening. So if required, data can determine if adjustments need to be made to improve the efficacy of our plan. <clears throat> For example, if we know that we have a major concert being held at a specific location, we can move all the water stations there to that area so that they can be better accessed. On the other hand, for things like hospitals, um, if, the ho if one hospital is particularly busier than usual, we can use methods to, away, to transfer away less urgent patients to other hospitals. We can also communicate within the paramedic services to, to coordinate that. Um, and we can also reduce um, things like ambulatory clinics that may compete for resources. And finally, step 10. <clears throat> so after all that, um, we're now at step 10, which in my opinion is also a very important step. It requires us not only to imagine this emergency, to predict how some of these events might unravel, but also to imagine what the emergency will be when it comes to an end. So similar to declaring an emergency, sometimes it's helpful to establish thresholds for undeployment of the incident command system as well. So when can we really declare an emergency over? 
Um, in this case, could it be that when the weather cools down or that the weather stays warm, but we're seeing that people are actually adapting fairly well and taking the necessary precautions or that our hospital usage remains quite manageable and there's not really a problem on the front lines. So ramping down um, such an emergency also requires us to identify the stakeholders left responsible for coordinating those final tasks while other departments can go back to supporting routine duties. So for example, uh, once the crowds disperse from the events and they come to an end, the police services might need to resume routine operations. On the other hand, um, hospital services may continue to respond to sick patients and the local health unit might want to summarize the emergency. So these recovery duties can really last for weeks or months and up to years even after an emergency. And similarly, we might decide to perform an audit on the appropriateness or success of our responses. Um, or we can even collect and use that data to inform future action plans in similar situations. So for the time being, I'm going to turn back to Nitin, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about the incidents command system. Thank you, Karina. Next slide, please. So at this point, um, I think we're familiar with, um, I think with previous slide, please, Andy, if you don't mind. Thank you. At this point, I think we're familiar with some of the com um, complexity um, with regards to emergencies. Um, we have some frameworks in mind. We have a decision um, matrix that we can tap into, but we want to expand on the incident command system in some more detail. Uh, and to provide some background uh, real quick, the incident uh, command system was initially developed to address problems with interagency responses to wildfires in California and Arizona. Uh, but it is now a component of the National Incident Management System here in the U.S., uh, where it has evolved into use in all hazard situations, um, you know, ranging from anything such as active shootings to even hazmat scenes. Next slide, please, Andy. And if you can please um, uh, mute uh, the microphone right now, um, providing feedback. I, you know, and I, you know, I had a, I had, I've had patients where they've had problems with home health. Thank you, Andy. Um, in this slide, we have a, a general framework for the incident command system. Um, again, this is a standardized approach uh, to the command, control, and coordination of emergency responses. Uh, it provides a common hierarchy. Um, essentially, it, it's a militaristic template uh, within which responders from multiple agencies can be effective. Uh, what we want to establish here is a clear chain of command and communication. Uh, in an emergency situation, um, things are chaotic. You know, it's in a dynamic environment. Information is flowing fast. Um, there are multiple stakeholders involved, and it's important to have a system in place that conveys information in an efficient um, and effective manner. When an emergency occurs, uh, as Karina mentioned, there is a restructuring to help prepare actions moving forward. Um, again, this, this slide here is meant to provide a high-level structure, and it is, it's important to note that this may change uh, depending on the organization, geography, or situation. So we may add or remove certain branches. Uh, depending you know, on our need. It's an, also important to understand that we may have multiple ICSs established for the same event. The various sectors will be involved and establishing the ICS for each sector enables one main point of contact that will communicate with others. So an example would be, um, if you recall the slide where we showed infrastructure damage, um, you may have one incident command center um, or system that's established by FEMA or the Ministry of Transportation um, and a concurrent one established by public health. Uh, so the incident commander from public health would communicate with the incident commander from FEMA, uh, ensure information um, is available for FEMA to help inform best practices moving forward. Um, and as Karina referenced, people will be redeployed to maximize their skill set. Um, so we can expand or retract the size of the um, ICS as needed. Um, so, in, you know, environments such as emergencies that are dynamic, it's important to understand that there may be situations initially where um, we have a very large incident command center um, or, or station rather, or, and, and there may be situations where there are multiple ones, and we may be able to retract them as the emergency uh, progresses and hopefully we, we improve our responses. Next slide, please, Andy. All the examples that were touched upon at the beginning of this lecture uh, would be classified as incidents um, and, we and would be best approached under an ICS model. Um, so again, we have a, an image here um, of what looks like a single uh, 
motor vehicle accident. But I, I think what we're trying to emphasize is that, um, you know, these are population level impacts. Um, and as Sandra alluded to earlier, um, while we interpret these to be public health emergencies, uh, really public health encompasses every part of our sector. We're talking about population level impact here. Um, so if, if there's um, uh, an emergency that, that may be perceived as, as strictly under the purview of fire services, uh, really what we're trying to establish is, is the need for stakeholder collaboration across all of our sectors um, and how this, this incorporates um, some of the ideologies that, that we've discussed uh, in the seminar in terms of understanding the emergencies, how to classify them, uh, how best to approach them, and in, in this scenario, um, how best to communicate information um, in a dynamic situation. Next slide, Andy. Uh, we have a quote here that, that we're quite fond of um, from Dr. Bill Smith of the USDA, uh, the Veterinary Services. Uh, what he says is, um, he summarizes his experience using the ICS, uh, and he says, the first time I really used ICS was at Harrisonburg, Virginia, in response to a low path influenza outbreak. The ICS allows us to organize and plan to make sure all the major tasks that need to be done are identified and someone is charged to make sure it's done. And then with, what, with that, uh, with the hierarchy, with the organization structures, who you report to is done and we can organize it. It's flexible in that you can use them for small outbreaks, big outbreaks, it has a self-contained organizational system built into it, can be used for any, any type of animal health event. It doesn't have to be disease of magnitude. It can be as simple as moving an area office, if you will, or a federal office or moving people, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, one disease outbreak or a huge disease outbreak, it doesn't matter. That's how I would define the beauty of the flexibility of it. And I think that's important here. Um, again, you know, emergencies uh, is not a one size fit all. They're often specific. They're unique in, in, in how they present. Um, but our ability to coordinate our response uh, in a manner that is most effective um, will, will do benefit to the populations that we serve. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen some of the, the, the benefits and some of the downfalls of communication being um, uh, disseminated efficiently and effectively um, throughout, you know, our, our pandemic and some issues where, where that may not have been done as, as best as possible. Next slide, please. Because of today's uh, budget constraints, limited staffing of local, state, and federal agencies, it's not possible for any one agency to handle all the management and resource needs for the increasing numbers of incidents nationwide. Local, state, and federal agencies must work together in a smooth, coordinated effort under the same management system. The ICS is a standardized on-scene, all-risk incident management concept. It allows its users to adopt an integrated organizational structure to match the complexities and demands of single or multiple incidents without being hindered by jurisdictional boundaries. ICS has considerable internal flexibility. It can grow or shrink to meet different needs. This flexibility makes it a very cost-effective and efficient management approach for both small and large situations. Next slide, please, Andy. Great, thanks, Nitin. So I guess for the last part of the lecture, we just wanted to share some lessons learned on NPI strategies. And now we're going to specify um, some examples from public health emergencies as a result of communicable disease. So FEMA and the CDC do actually routinely practice global emergency scenarios. And most often the working example is a respiratory disease pandemic. So there is really good reason for this. Um, almost all significant epidemics that we've seen in history most recently have been respiratory. So uh, things like SARS-CoV-1, MERS, um, H1N1, influenza, um, and now with COVID-19, it doesn't really come as a surprise. Um, next slide, please, Andy. And one more, please. <clears throat> um, so typically epidemics can be described as having three phases. So containment, mitigation, and recovery. Simply put, that means that in the first phase, we're trying to contain the spread of disease within our local communities. That means reducing travel from endemic locations as sort of case and contact tracing, <clears throat> and also trying to break that chain of transmission. After that, when we have too many cases to track, we might start seeing more local transmission, which really means that the disease is propagating through the community without us really knowing where and how. So at that point, case investigations become more difficult because people can be infected at school, at work, at the grocery store, in areas that they really have felt previously safe. 
And in these cases too, sometimes the definition of an individual outbreak can become very difficult to isolate. Um, because if we consider it, um, a healthcare worker at a hospital could go home and infect their spouse, who's a school teacher, who then transmits it to the classroom, to their students, and into different other households. Um, and finally, we have the recovery phase. So like all emergencies, eventually the response does need to come to a natural end. And whether that means we've successfully broken that train of transmission, or that we've successfully eradicated the disease with interventions like vaccines, or, or if the disease has really become seeded and endemic to our community. So based on um, three different phases, we'll commonly use different MPIs strategies for each different phase. So starting with this containment phase, during the containment phase, we've tried our best to really communicate accurate and timely information on COVID-19. However, disjointed information on, say, whether COVID-19 was transmitted by droplet or airborne and confounding mask policies really wore away at public trust early on. We also saw uh, social distancing and lockdown measures, which were used in some states to varying levels. And these were really based on political acceptability. <clears throat> Sometimes these decisions were evidence-based and actually saved a lot of hospitals from being overwhelmed. But on the other hand, some of these moves were very reactive, um, such as closing down restaurants and had a really large cost to society in the long run. During containment, we also saw restricted travel and tightening of border traffic, especially for those land access states. Um, and that was a very useful way of preventing travel-related infections from entering the country. Um, this was a particularly important step in limiting the seeding of COVID in, U in the U.S. early on. And then talking about PPE adherence and um, using cohorting in long-term care residents and hospitals, we could definitely see that there were major deficiencies in the logistics and actual implementation required. Um, and we can see that in the high casual rates, casualty rates in the first wave. Um, next step, please, Andy. So moving into the mitigation phase, um, it became more important to identify high priority populations for testing and vaccination. Communities themselves started developing more reliable social distancing plans themselves organically, such as with bubbling um, <clears throat> and more systematic disinfection and ventilation through businesses and safer work policies, um, such as work from home or additional sick days. Government infrastructure also improved during this time. Um, so we stood up better surveillance and contact tracing, forecasting models, um, and their results were being shared more widely with the public as they were being more educated. And um, we adopted more automation and routine. <clears throat> so things like over overseas flights were being corralled into centralized airport hubs to facilitate testing. And final step, please, Andy. <clears throat> And finally, for the recovery phase, um, we now had ma mass vaccinations and the use of vaccine passports in certain locations. Um, and this was a way of incentivizing further that herd immunity. Um, and now we have the availability of some rapid antigen testing for self-use at home. And we've even shortened isolation periods and downgraded to optional masking in some areas. So we can see that the transmission mechanisms of COVID have changed as the risks in the community cultural of fatigue um, has um, developed surrounding the emergency response. And in my opinion, this change is necessary as we get a better grip on what's happening with the evolving emergency. And as the disease becomes more tolerable and routine, we do need to start reducing resources and funding dedicated to one emergency so that they can be rerouted to more important priorities. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to Newton. Thank you, Karina. Um, next slide, please. So folks, this, this brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, and again, we wanna thank you all for giving us the opportunity um, to chat about such an important topic. Uh, we know there is a lot of information that we've given um, uh, and there's a lot to take away here. Um, if we can emphasize the, some, some points and, and just um, leave you with some takeaways is that um, in dynamic environments such as emergencies, um, uh, the need for stakeholder collaboration becomes more vital. Um, the ability to identify these emergencies, um, approach them um, in an evidence-informed and method methodological manner, um, increases the likelihood of efficient and effective um, um, outcomes. Um, additionally, ensuring that communication um, 
is sent through a chain of command to the ICS is another another way that we can prioritize the best outcomes. Um, if you have any feedback, uh, please feel free to email us at info at etio.ca, um, and we're happy to field any questions at this moment that you may have. It may be helpful, Andy, if we can go back to the, the grid and, and um, folks want to turn the camera on, cameras on or just unmute. I'll also mention that if someone thinks of a question, uh, feel free to email us if it's after. Daryl, I, I noticed that uh, you're chatting, but I think you're muted, so we weren't able to hear you. Oh, still can't hear you, Daryl. I'm sorry. Still muted. How about now? We're all good now. I, yeah. I think from uh, COVID, the thing that I have seen mostly is, I hate to bring up political, but I think the lines are drawn so so, uh, so much now between the two sides politically that people don't trust, the trust isn't there. And you know, and I've seen with COVID that people that you thought would go out and get vaccinated or would promote it, it's it's not there as much. Maybe it's getting better now, but in the beginning, you know, people didn't know what to believe, I think, is kind of what I'm saying. is how, how can we get people to buy into it that it's actually, you know, that bad and it's that we need to take measures? I think that overall is the hardest thing to get instilled in people that, you know, it's an actual emergency and have them buy into it. I, you know, I, I appreciate those sentiments, Earl. Um, I, it reminds me of a quote from a, a well-known um, outbreak management professor named Jonathan Freeman, um, who says that, uh, it's pulling it up right here, um, we must be transparent with media on outbreak data. Uh, and if you cover stuff up, the cover up becomes a story. And I think what's happened throughout the pandemic is whether it's by, um, whether it's accidental or by design, some of the information um, could have been given in, in a better manner. And I think you know, that the divide is, is, is definitely caused um, some issues on, from, from, from an emergency management standpoint. Um, the reality is, is our, our sector in public health is tied to governance. Um, it's something that, that you know, we're, we're sort of you know, bound to. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we, we try to be advantageous of various governments in terms of where opportunities lie for public health to make an impact. Um, but I think this, again, underscores the ability to have strong collaborative relationships with other sectors. Um, you know, public health traditionally um, has been seen as, you know, whether it's health promotional or vaccine campaigns, but really it encompasses everything from our, the ability to, to um, you know, uh, get fire, fire services, police departments, EMS, all working in a manner that, that serves the public. Um, oftentimes, even from our experience here uh, north of the border in Toronto, most people get their information through um, uh, your local police services Twitter, right? And, and we rely on them to convey public health information, you know, be it on whether it's an emergency or vaccinations, or at least route them to the correct sources. Um, so I, I appreciate your sentiment, Cyril. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that um, we're definitely living in a in a time of um, somewhat of an anti-establishment or um, challenging um, government challenging situation um, with both social media avenues, but as well as um, just a general fatigue. I think um, the population is tired of having so much information bombarded at them and we haven't quite honed into the expert groups who should be at the forefront of a certain situation. So in terms of public health, um, we, at the beginning of the pandemic, we haven't really seen the CDC you know, come out and speak on their behalf, but still the representation is very much from the politicians, um, both in <clears throat> Canada and in the US. And I think that does um, murky the water a little bit to the conversations that need to be had and the credibility of the sources that the information is coming from. Are there any other questions or comments that we can field while we have folks on with us? Again, if it's easier to um, uh, type it in the chat, I do see some right here. Maybe I'll pull them up. Okay. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions or folks can't think of anything right now, again, I'll. 
please feel free to email us if anything does arise. Uh, we'd be happy to field questions. Um, but I guess for the sake of time, um, again, we thank you all uh, for giving us the opportunity to chat. Thank you, Rain um, and Sandra as well for chiming in. Um, and we look forward to the next seminar. Thank you both for uh, today's presentation and all our participants for being here. I appreciate your time. And I will be sending out uh, the link to the recording of this. So if you want to review anything or share it with others, we were able to do that. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care. Stay safe.